solutions to the kinds of things we do. Wait, that's a long okay, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not supposed, uh, just I want to write one basically uh, URL website, uh, the name of a website so you can remember to go to it to catch up with the events we're doing. So it's www.ume.edu slash CGH. The reason I'm giving you this website is because in the front page, it has a place where you can go and join in and put your names and email addresses so we can keep you in a list and keep you informed and posted about the events the Center for Global Humanities is hosting and sponsoring events of this nature. Um, and then, and then I just want to remind you too, I've seen a lot of new faces, the Center for Global Humanities is sponsored, is funded by the University of New England to um, precisely to provide this kind of uh, cultural events. Um, it is geared towards the public, uh, it has a uh, public interest foremost in mind, and I think, I, I would hope our speaker tonight would appreciate that we are investing and not in the typical entertainment that a lot of people are in investing in, but in these forums for discussion, debate, reading, and so on. And I really do hope you spread the word, you keep coming, supporting these kinds of events, which we consider to be crucial for democratic life and for, for active citizenship. And it's, it's almost a miracle in these very hard financial times for a private institution like the University of New England to be doing this, to be sponsoring events of this nature, geared towards the public, not, not, not just for the students. Uh, with that in mind, I'd like to introduce our, our speaker. Of course, many of you are here because you know who the speaker is, but uh, my job is to introduce them, however briefly. And Chris Hedges, uh, his column is published every Monday, if I'm not mistaken, in, in the, on the website Truth Dig. Uh, he spent two decades as a foreign reporter covering wars in Latin America, Africa, Europe, and the Middle East. He served for eight years as the Middle East Bureau uh, Chief of the New York Times, where he shared the 2002 Pulitzer Prize for explanatory journalism for coverage of terrorism, and for basically for his coverage of terrorism. Had just also received the 2002 Amnesty International Global Award for Human Rights Journalism. His accomplishments are many, and uh, he is currently a senior fellow at the Nation Institute and the Anschutz Distinguished Fellow at Princeton University. He has written nine books, including Empire of Illusion, and uh, I Don't Believe in Atheists, and the best-selling American fascists, The Christian Right and the War on America, published in 2008. His book, War is a Force That Gives Us Meaning, published in 2003, was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award for Nonfiction. Hedges holds a B bachelor's degree in English from Colgate College and a Master of Divinity degree from Harvard Divinity School. He is fluent in many languages, including Arabic, French, Spanish, Greek, and Latin. Without much ado, I'd like to introduce the speaker tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so much of what informed uh, this current book, Empire of Illusion, comes out of uh, the personal experience of my own family uh, who live uh, in Poland, Norway, Mechanic Falls. Um, <laughs> and I watched over the years what the destruction of the manufacturing base of this country has done to their lives. And much of my anger uh, towards what's happened to the working class in this country is quite personal because it's affected people that I love very deeply. Uh, I come from a long line of main eccentrics. Uh, my grandfather, who was a sergeant master, they were all veterans, um, 
He was a sergeant uh, major in the Army and then later a Maine guide. Um, and I grew up in the woods of Maine. Uh, I could strip down and put together a, a 22 Springfield rifle by the time I was eight years old. Uh, I went through the entire uh, NRA program, uh, courtesy of my relatives. This appalled my father, by the way, who was a pacifist and a Presbyterian minister, and who came from New York City, and who uh, my relatives openly derided as a faggot. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I just have to tell two classic main stories before I begin my talk. Um, we used to have a wood lot up uh, outside of Mechanic Falls, and uh, I had my uncle, one of my uncles ran the local lumber mill, and uh, of course they all drove trucks and they all had gun racks with veterans plates. And um, one day he and one of his mill workers we're driving, it was a dirt road, we're driving down a dirt road, and there were two guys from Massachusetts with chainsaws who were stealing all of our wood and loading it on the back of a pickup truck. Uh, my uncle was a Marine in Iwo Jima, um, and killing came very naturally to him. He um, yanked a shotgun off uh, his gun rack, uh, walked out the door, loaded it, and pointed at these two guys from Massachusetts. And uh, he said, um, you guys have three to get off this lot. One, two, and they dropped their chainsaws and ran um, because they instinctually knew that he would have pulled the trigger. Um, but the funny part of it is that uh, they then took him to court uh, for uh, the local court uh, uh, for, I don't know, endangering their lives or threatening them or something, thinking that they were going to get justice in Mechanic Falls. <laughs> and uh, of course, they called up. Uh, my uncle, who denied everything, and then they called up uh, the, his mill worker in the truck, who I remember when he sat down in the court, he says, I didn't see nothing. <laughs> um, the other story that's sort of uh, iconic is um, my grandfather lived down the road from a guy named Stubb Chapman, and uh, you can't, that's just, you can't invent a name like that, and Stubb, uh, uh, had, uh, he was probably a manic depressive, or you know, nobody knew what these things were back then. And he was always threatening to kill himself. Uh, but before he would, uh, he never managed to do it, but before these uh, uh, purported attempts to sort of end his life, he would come around and say goodbye to all his friends. And I was uh, sitting with my grandfather one day, I was just a little kid, and Stubb comes to the door and he's got a rope. And he said, uh, well, Phil, I, I just came to say goodbye because I'm going to hang myself. And my grandfather said, gosh, Stubb, don't do it with that new rope because <laughs> nobody is going to want it. After you, Let me go get an old rope from my barn and give it to you. <clears throat> I got to tell one more main story. <laughs> my grandfather used to bottle, um, his last name was Prince, and he used to bottle Prince's insect repellent. Um, which in his barn, and then he, he, he drove an Impala and smoked unfiltered camera cigarettes. And so he would bottle this insect repellent in a barn, they were little brown glass bottles, and then I would drive with him, or actually when I was like seven or eight, he would actually put me on, my, on his lap and let me drive. But we would be going down these main roads up to Norway and stuff, to Woodman's, and where he would sell his insect repellent. Uh, and I always, you know, remember as a kid that driving in that big car with a cigarette, with a camel cigarette and this, the smell of camphor oil and a little bottle sort of tinkling. So when I was about 10 or 11, uh, he decides that he's going to tell me the secret formula for Prince's insect repellent. So he takes me out to the barn and he gives me a Bible. And he makes me put the hand on the Bible and he said, okay, I'm going to tell you the secret formula for Prince's insect repellent. Do you swear on your life, on this Bible, that you will never tell anyone? And I said, yes. And then he said, and now, do you doubly swear that you will never tell your mother, who was his daughter? <laughs> All right, enough story. <laughs> In celebrity culture, we destroy what we worship. The commercial exploitation of Michael Jackson's death was orchestrated by the corporate forces 
that rendered Jackson insane. Jackson robbed of his childhood and surrounded by vultures that preyed on his fears and weaknesses, was so consumed by self-loathing, he carved his African-American face into a Caucasian death mask. He hid his apparent pedophilia behind a Peter Pan illusion of eternal childhood. He could not disentangle his public and his private self. He became a commodity, a product, one to be sold, used, and manipulated. He was infected by the moral nihilism and personal disintegration that is at the core of our corporate culture. And his fantasies of eternal youth, delusions of majesty, and desperate disfiguring quests for physical transformation were an expression of our own yearning. He was a reflection of us in the extreme. His memorial service, a variety show with a coffin, had an average of 31.1 million television viewers. It was the final episode of the long-running Michael Jackson series. The stories that enthrall us are real-life stories, early fame, wild success, and then a long, bizarre, and macabre emotional train wreck. O.J. Simpson offered a tamer version of the same plot, so does Tiger Woods and Britney Spears. Jackson, by the end, was heavily in debt and had weathered a $22 million out-of-court settlement to Jordy Chandler, as well as seven counts of child sexual abuse and two counts of administering an intoxicating agent in order to commit a felony. Jackson reflected our own physical and psychological disintegration, especially with many Americans struggling with overwhelming debt, loss of status, and deep personal confusion. The lurid drama of Jackson's personal life meshed perfectly with the ongoing dramas on television, in movies, and the news. News reports on television are many dramas. They come complete with a star, a villain, a supporting cast, a good-looking host, and a dramatic and often unexpected ending. In Fahrenheit 451, Ray Bradbury's novel about a future dystopia, people spend most of the day watching giant television screens that show endless scenes of police chases and criminal apprehensions. Life, Bradbury understood, once it was packaged, scripted, given a narrative and filmed, became the most compelling form of entertainment. And Jackson was a great show. He deserved a great finale. Those who created Jackson's public persona and turned him into a piece of property, first as a child, and finally as a corpse encased in a $15,000 golden casket, are the agents, publicists, marketing departments, promoters, plastic surgeons, script writers, television and movie producers, advertisers, video technicians, wardrobe consultants, and television personalities who orchestrate the vast stage of celebrity for profit. They are the puppet masters. No one achieves celebrity status. No cultural illusion is swallowed as reality without these armies of cultural enablers and intermediaries. The producers at the Staples Centers in Los Angeles made sure the 18,000 attendees and television audience, and even the BBC devoted three hours to the tribute, watched a funeral that was turned into another maudlin form of uplifting popular entertainment. The memorial service for Jackson was a celebration of celebrity. There was the queasy sight of groups of children, including his own, singing over the coffin. 
Brooke Shields fighting back tears recalled how she and a 33-year-old Jackson, who always maintained that he was a straight male, broke into Elizabeth Taylor's room the night before her wedding because Michael was too excited to wait until morning to see the wedding gown. Shields and Jackson at Taylor's wedding then, quote, pretended to be the mother and father of Elizabeth Taylor. It sounds weird, Shields said, but we made it real. There were photo montages in which a shot of Michael Jackson shaking hands with Nelson Mandela was immediately followed by one of him with Kermit the Frog. <laughs> Celebrity culture reduces all of the famous to the same level. Fame is its own denominator, and every anecdote told about Jackson seemed to confirm that when you spend your life as a celebrity, you have no idea who you are. And yet, we measure our lives by these celebrities. We seek to be like them. We emulate their look and behavior. We escape the messiness of real life through the fantasy of their stardom. We too long to attract admiring audiences for our grand, ongoing life movie. We try to see ourselves moving through our life as a camera would see us, mindful of how we hold ourselves, how we dress, what we say. We invent movies that play inside our heads with us as stars. We wonder how an audience would react. Celebrity culture has taught us, almost unconsciously, to generate interior, personal screenplays. We have learned ways of speaking and thinking that grossly disfigure the way we relate to the world and those around us. Neil Gabler, who has written wisely about this, argues that celebrity culture is not a convergence of consumer culture and religion so much as a hostile takeover of religion by consumer culture. Jackson desperately feared growing old. He believed he could manipulate race and gender. He transformed himself through surgery and perhaps female hormones from a brown-skinned African-American male to a chalk-faced androgynous figure with no clear sexual identity. And while he pushed these boundaries to the extreme, he only did what many Americans do. There were 12 million cosmetic plastic surgery procedures performed last year in the United States. They were performed because in America, most human beings, rich and poor, famous and obscure, have been conditioned to view themselves as marketable commodities. They are objects, like consumer products. They have no intrinsic value. They must look fabulous and live on fabulous sets. They must remain young. They must achieve notoriety and money, or the illusion of it, to be a success. And it does not matter how they get there. Celebrity culture licenses a dark voyeurism into other people's humiliation, pain, weakness, and betrayal, education, building community, honesty, transparency, and sharing are qualities that will see you ridiculed and voted off any reality show. Fellow competitors for prize money and a chance for fleeting fame elect to disappear the unwanted. In the final credits of the reality show America's Next Top Model, a picture of the woman expelled during the episode vanishes from the group portrait on the screen. Those cast aside become, at least to the television audience, non-persons. Celebrities that can no longer generate publicity, good or bad, vanish. Life, these shows teach is a brutal world of unadulterated competition and a constant quest for notoriety and attention. Our self-exaltation permits the humiliation of those who oppose us. Those who lose 
deserve to be erased. Those who fail, those who are deemed ugly, ignorant, or poor, are belittled and mocked. Human beings are used, betrayed, and discarded in a commodity culture, which is pretty much the story of Jackson's life. The cult of the self, which Jackson embodied, dominates our culture. This cult has within it the classic traits of psychopaths, superficial charm, grandiosity, self-importance, a need for constant stimulation, a penchant for lying, deception, and manipulation, and the incapacity for remorse or guilt. Jackson, from his phony marriages to the portraits of himself dressed as royalty, had all these qualities. And this is also the ethic promoted by corporations. It is the ethic of unfettered capitalism. It is the misguided belief that personal style and personal advancement, mistaken for individualism, are the same as democratic equality. It is the celebration of image over substance. We have a right in the cult of the self to get whatever we desire. We can do anything, even belittle and destroy those around us, including our friends, to make money, to be happy, and to become famous. Once fame and wealth are achieved, they become their own justification, their own morality. How one gets there is irrelevant. And it is this perverted ethic that gave us Wall Street bankers and investment houses that willfully trashed the global economy, stole money from tens of millions of small shareholders who had bought stock in these corporations for retirement or college. The heads of these corporations, like the winners on a reality television program, who lied and manipulated others to succeed, walked away with hundreds of millions of dollars in bonuses and compensation. The ethic of Wall Street is the ethic of celebrity. But the tantalizing illusions offered by our consumer culture are vanishing as we head towards collapse. The ability of the corporate state to pacify the country by extending credit and providing cheap manufactured goods to the masses is gone. The jobs we are shedding are not coming back, as Lawrence Summers tacitly acknowledges when he talks of a jobless recovery. The belief that democracy lies in the choice between competing brands and the accumulation of vast sums of personal wealth at the expense of others has been exposed as a fraud. Freedom can no longer be conflated with a free market and the travails of the poor are rapidly becoming the travails of the middle class, especially as unemployment insurance runs out. Class warfare once buried under the happy illusion that we were all going to enter an age of prosperity with unfettered capitalism is returning with a vengeance. In his book, Democracy Incorporated, Sheldon Rowan, who taught political philosophy at Berkeley and later at Princeton, uses the phrase inverted totalitarianism to describe our political system. Inverted totalitarianism, unlike classical totalitarianism, does not revolve around a demagogue or charismatic leader. It finds expression in the anonymity of the corporate state. It purports to cherish democracy, patriotism, and the Constitution, while manipulating internal levers to subvert and thwart democratic process. Political candidates are elected in popular votes by citizens, but are ruled by armies of corporate lobbyists in Washington or state capitals who author the legislation and get the legislators to pass it. A corporate media controls nearly everything we read, watch, or hear. It imposes a bland uniformity of opinion. It diverts us with trivia 
and celebrity gossip. In classical totalitarian regimes, such as Nazi fascism or Soviet communism, economics was subordinate to politics. Under inverted totalitarianism, the reverse is true, Roland writes. Economics dominates politics. And with that domination comes different forms of ruthlessness. The Obama brand offers us an image that appears radically individualistic and new. The image inoculates us from seeing that the old engines of corporate power and the vast military industrial complex continue to plunder the country. Brand Obama is about being happy consumers. We are entertained, we feel hopeful, we like our president, we believe he is like us. But like all branded products spun out from the manipulative world of corporate advertising, we are being duped into doing and supporting a lot of things that are not in our interest. A few weeks before Obama won the presidential elections, Obama beat Nike, Apple, Coors, and Zappos to win the Association of National Advertisers' top annual award, Marketer of the Year. And corporations, in ironic reversal, are using the Obama brand to sell their products, from Pepsi's Choose Change campaign to IKEA's Embrace Change 09 to Southwest Airlines' offer of Yes You Can tickets. The White House has become just another reality television show starring family Obama. But what for all our faith and hope has the Obama brand given us? His administration has spent, lent, or guaranteed $12.8 trillion in taxpayer dollars to Wall Street and insolvent banks in a doomed effort to re-inflate the bubble economy, a tactic that at best forestalls catastrophe and will leave us broke in a time of profound crisis. Brand Obama has allocated nearly $1 trillion in defense-related spending and the continuation of our doomed imperial project in Iraq, where military planners now estimate that between 50 and 70,000 troops will remain for the next 15 to 20 years. Brand Obama has expanded the war in Afghanistan, including the use of drones set on cross-border bombing runs into Pakistan that have left over 700 civilians dead since Obama took office. Brand Obama has refused to ease restrictions so workers can organize, and because of pressure, from the for-profit healthcare industry refuses to consider single-payer, not-for-profit healthcare for all Americans. And Brand Obama will not prosecute the Bush administration for war crimes, including the use of torture, and has refused to dismantle Bush's secrecy laws or restore habeas corpus. Corporations which control our politics no longer produce products that are different, but brands that are different. Brand Obama does not threaten the core of the corporate state any more than did brand George W. Bush. The Bush brand collapsed. We became immune to its studied folksiness. We saw through its artifice, and this is a common deflation in the world of advertising. So we have been given a new Obama brand with an exciting and faintly erotic appeal. Benetton and Calvin Klein were the precursors to the Obama brand, using ads to associate themselves with risque style and progressive politics. It gave their products an edge. But the goal, as with all brands, was to fool passive consumers that a brand is an experience. The decline of American empire began long before the current economic meltdown or the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. 
It began before the first Gulf War or Ronald Reagan. It began when we shifted, in the words of the Harvard historian Charles Mayer, from an empire of production to an empire of consumption. By the end of the Vietnam War, when the costs of the war ate away at Lyndon Johnson's great society, and domestic oil production began its steady, inexorable decline, we saw our country transform from one that primarily produced to one that primarily consumed. We started borrowing to maintain a level of consumption as well as an empire we could no longer afford. We began to use force, especially in the Middle East, to feed our insatiable thirst for cheap oil. And the bill is now due. America's most dangerous enemies are not Islamic radicals, but those who sold us the perverted ideology of free market capitalization, of free market capitalism and globalization. They have dynamited the very foundations of our society. In the 17th century, these speculators would have been hung. Today, they run the government and consume billions in taxpayer subsidies. These corporate forces will never permit real reform. It would mean their extinction. The oil and gas industry will never allow us to achieve energy independence. That would devastate their profits. Real reform would wipe out tens of billions of dollars in weapons contracts. It would cripple the financial health of a host of private contractors, from Lockheed Martin to Boeing to Northrop Grumman to Raytheon to Halliburton. And it would render obsolete the existence of the US Central Command. It was Bill Clinton who led the Democratic Party to the corporate watering trough. Clinton argued that the party could ditch labor unions, no longer a source of votes or power, as a political ally. Workers, he insisted, would vote Democratic anyway. They had no choice. It was better, he argued, to take corporate money and do corporate bidding. By the 1990s, the Democratic Party, under Clinton's leadership, had virtual fundraising parity with the Republicans. Today, the Democrats get more. The legislation demanded by corporations, including the North American Free Trade Agreement, thrust a knife into the back of the American working class. NAFTA was peddled by the Clinton White House as an opportunity to raise incomes and prosperity of the citizens of the United States, Canada, and Mexico. NAFTA would also we were told staunch Mexican immigration into the United States. But NAFTA, which took effect in 1994, reversed every one of Clinton's predictions. Once the Mexican government lifted price supports on corn and beans grown by Mexican farmers, those farmers had to compete against the huge agribusinesses in the United States. Many Mexican farmers were swiftly bankrupt at least two million Mexican farmers have been driven off their land since 1994. And guess where many of them went? This desperate flight of poor Mexicans into the United States is now being exacerbated by large-scale factory closures along the border as manufacturers pack up and leave Mexico for China. But we were assured that goods would be cheaper Workers would be wealthier. Everyone would be happier. I'm not sure how these contradictory things were supposed to happen, but in a soundbite society, reality no longer matters. NAFTA was great if you were a corporation. It was a disaster if you were a worker. And we are now getting taste of Clinton's draconian welfare reform bill signed in 1996, as tens of millions of Americans faced the prospect of losing their unemployment benefits 
and attempting to survive on the $143 a month you receive from welfare. It was the Clinton administration led by Summers which signed into law the Financial Services Modernization Act of 1999. This act ripped down the firewalls that had been established by the 1933 Glass-Steagall Act designed to prevent the kind of meltdown we are now experiencing. Glass-Steagall established the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. It set in place banking reforms to stop speculators from hijacking the financial system. With Glass-Steagall demolished and the passage of NAFTA, the Democrats led by Clinton tumbled gleefully into bed with corporations and Wall Street speculators and many of the architects of this deregulation, economists such as Summers, have come back to serve corporate interests in the Obama White House. The cost of our empire of illusion is not being paid for by corporate titans. It is being paid for on the streets of our inner cities, in former manufacturing towns, and in depressed rural enclaves. Human beings are not commodities. They are not goods. Their misery is not morally excusable because of the demands of the market. They grieve and suffer and feel despair. They lose their dignity with their jobs, their sense of self-worth, and frequently struggle in unemployment with depression and feelings of worthlessness. Human beings, not corporations, raise children and maintain communities. And the growing class divide is not understood despite the goodness of many in the media by complicated sets of statistics, lines on a graph that chart stocks, or the absurd utopian faith in unregulated globalization and complicated trade deals. It is understood in the eyes of a man or woman who is no longer making enough money to live with dignity and hope. It is understood in this profound and expanding personal despair. The desperation spreading across the United States is unleashing not simply a recession. We have been in a recession for some time now, but a depression unlike anything we have seen since the 1930s. It has provided a pool of broken people willing to work for low wages and to do without unions or benefits. For the bottom 90% of Americans, annual income has been in a slow, steady decline for three decades. There are 50 million Americans in real poverty and tens of millions of Americans in a category called near poverty. One in eight Americans and one in four children depends on food stamps to eat the assault on the American working class, an assault that has devastated members of my own family in the former mill towns in Maine, shows no sign of abatement. In the past three years, nearly one in five U.S. workers was laid off. Among workers laid off from full-time work, roughly one-fourth were earning less than $40,000 a year. And there are whole sections of the United States that are beginning to resemble the developing world. There has been a Weimarization of the American working class, and the assault on the middle class is underway. Anything that can be put on software, from finance to architecture to engineering, can and is being outsourced to workers in countries such as India or China who accept pay a fraction of that of their Western counterparts and work without benefits. And both the Republican and Democratic parties beholding to corporations for money and power.
are responsible. Washington has become our Versailles. The media has evolved into a class of courtiers. Democrats, like the Republicans, are mostly courtiers. Our pundits, academic experts, and financial analysts, at least those with prominent public platforms, are courtiers. We are captivated by the hollow stagecraft of political theater as we are ruthlessly stripped of power. The role of courtiers is to parrot official propaganda. Courtiers do not defy the elite or question the structure of the corporate state. The corporations, in return, employ them and promote them as celebrities or elected officials. Courtiers in face powder deceive us in the name of journalism. Courtiers in our political parties promise to look out for our interests and then pass bill after bill to further corporate fraud and abuse. And no class of courtiers. From the eunuchs behind the Manchus in the 19th century to the Baghdad caliphs in the Abbasid Caliphate has ever transformed itself into a responsible and socially productive class. Courtiers are hedonists of power. Being a courtier requires agility and eloquence, and the most talented of them should be credited as persuasive actors. They entertain us. They make us feel good. They persuade us. They are our friends. They are the smiley faces of a corporate state that has hijacked the government. And when the corporations make their iron demands, these courtiers drop to their knees. They placate the telecommunications companies that want to be protected from lawsuits. They permit oil and gas companies to rake in obscene profits and keep in place the vast subsidies of corporate welfare doled out by the state. They allow our profit-driven healthcare system to leave the uninsured and underinsured to suffer and die. And over 40,000 Americans died last year because they could not get proper medical care. The for-profit healthcare industry, like the defense industry, makes money off of death and suffering. It is legally permitted to hold a sick child in our country hostage while their families frantically bankrupt themselves to save their sons or daughters. Any discussion of health care should acknowledge the fact that our for-profit health care system is the problem and must be destroyed. Only then can we have an honest debate about what comes next. But this will never happen. It will never happen because the industry's money and lobbyists drive the discussion, as well as the shape of the so-called health care reform bill. And the courtiers in Washington and on the television screens dance to the tune they play. America is devolving into a third world nation. And if we do not immediately halt our elites' rapacious looting of the public treasury and our bizarre state socialism for corporations, we will be left with trillions in debts which can never be repaid and widespread human misery which we will be helpless to ameliorate. Our anemic democracy will be replaced with a robust national police state. The elite will withdraw into heavily guarded, gated communities where they will have access to security, goods, and services that cannot be afforded by the rest of us. Tens of millions of people, brutally controlled, will live in perpetual poverty, a state of neo-feudalism. This is the inevitable result of unchecked corporate capitalism. 
The stimulus and bailout plans are not about saving us. They are about saving them. As the economist Paul Krugman has noted, anyone who has seen how economic statistics are constructed knows that they are really a subgenre of science fiction. This science fiction has been steadily employed to camouflage our economic decline. President Ronald Reagan included 1.5 million U.S. Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Service personnel with a civilian workforce to magically reduce the nation's unemployment rate by 2%. President Clinton decided that those who had given up looking for work or those who wanted full-time jobs but could only find part-time employment were no longer to be counted as unemployed. If you work more than 21 hours a week, and most low-wage workers at places like Walmart average 28 hours a week, you are counted as employed, although your real wages put you below the poverty line. Our actual unemployment rate when you include those who have stopped looking for work and those who can only find poorly paid part-time jobs is not 10%, but somewhere between 17 and 20%. A sixth of the country is now effectively unemployed, and we are shedding jobs at a faster rate than in the months after the 1929 crash. Franklin Delano Roosevelt recognized the danger of unregulated capitalism. He sent a message to Congress on April 29, 1938, titled, Recommendations to the Congress to Curb Monopolies and the Concentration of Economic Power. In it, he wrote, the first truth is that the liberty of democracy is not safe if the people tolerate the growth of power to a point where it becomes stronger than the democratic state itself. That, in its essence, is fascism. Ownership of government by an individual, by a group, or by any other controlling private power. The second truth is that the liberty of a democracy is not safe if its business system does not provide employment and produce and distribute goods in such a way to sustain an acceptable standard of living. The rise of the corporate state has grave political consequences, as we saw in Italy and Germany in the early part of the 20th century. Antitrust laws not only regulate and control the marketplace, they serve as bulwarks to protect democracy. And now that they're gone, now that we have a state run by and on behalf of corporations, we must expect inevitable, and I fear terrifying, consequences. As the pressure mounts, as this despair and desperation reaches into larger and larger segments of the populace, the mechanisms of corporate and government control are being bolstered to prevent civil unrest and instability. The emergence of the corporate state always means the emergence of the security state. And this is why the Bush White House pushed through the Patriot Act and its renewal, the suspension of habeas corpus, the practice of extraordinary rendition, warrantless wiretapping on American citizens, and the refusal to ensure free and fair elections with verifiable ballot counting. The motive behind these measures is not to fight terrorism or to bolster national security. It is to seize and maintain internal control. And it is about control of us. Senator Frank Church, as chairman of the Select Committee on Intelligence in 1975, investigated the government's massive and highly secretive national security agency. He was alarmed at the ability of the state to intrude into private lives. He wrote when he finished his investigation, 
That capacity at any time could be turned around on the American people, and no American would have any privacy left. Such is the capability to monitor everything, telephone conversations, telegrams, it doesn't matter. There would be no place to hide. If this government ever became a tyranny, if a dictator ever took charge in this country, the technological capacity that the intelligence community has given the government could enable it to impose total tyranny. And there would be no way to fight back. Because the most careful effort to combine together in resistance to the government, no matter how privately it was done, is within the reach of the government to know. When Senator Church made this statement, the NSA was not authorized to spy on American citizens. Today it is. In his book, The Great Transformation, written in 1944, Carl Pugliani laid out the devastating consequences, the depressions, wars, and inevitable totalitarianism that grow out of a so-called self-regulated free market. He grasped that fascism like socialism was rooted in a market society that refused to function. He warned that a financial system always devolved without heavy government control into a mafia capitalism and a mafia political system. All traditional standards and beliefs are shattered in a severe economic crisis. The moral order is turned upside down. The honest and industrious are wiped out, while the gangsters, profiteers, and speculators walk away with millions. A self-regulating market inevitably turns human beings and the natural environment into commodities, a situation that ensures the destruction of both society in the natural world. The free market's assumption that nature and human beings are objects whose worth is determined by the market allows each to be exploited for profit until exhaustion or collapse. A society that no longer recognizes that nature and human life have a sacred dimension, an intrinsic value beyond monetary value commits collective suicide. Such societies cannibalize themselves until they die. We face an environmental meltdown that is linked to our economic meltdown. Polar ice caps are melting. Sea levels are rising. Russia's northern coastline has begun producing huge quantities of toxic methane gas. Scientists with the International Siberian Shelf Study described what they saw along the coastline recently as methane chimneys reaching from the sea floor to the ocean surface. Methane locked in the permafrost of Arctic landmasses is being released at an alarming rate as average Arctic temperatures rise. Methane is a greenhouse gas 25 times more powerful and carbon dioxide. The release of millions of tons of it will significantly accelerate the rate of global warming. The continued release of large quantities of methane, some scientists have warned, could actually asphyxiate the human species. But even in the face of this crisis, the oil and gas industry, along with the coal industry, have blunted serious reform. Profit comes before the urgent task to save the ecosystem on which human life depends. Our working class, which has desperately borrowed money to stay afloat as real wages have dropped, now face years, maybe decades, of stagnant or declining incomes without access to new credit. The national treasury is being drained on behalf of speculative commercial interests. The government, the only institutions citizens have that is big enough 
and powerful enough to protect its rights is becoming weaker, more anemic, and increasingly unable to help the mass of Americans who are embarking on a period of profound deprivation. We have been borrowing at the rate of more than $2 billion a day over the last decade. And at some point, it has to end. By 2010, because of the bailout, stimulus, packages, giveaways, and short-term debt, we will have to finance $5 trillion in debt. That is about $96 billion in debt auctioned off every week. If China and the oil-rich states do not buy this debt, the buyer of last resort will be the Federal Reserve. And this will have the effect of essentially printing endless amounts of money. Our currency, at this point, will become junk. A furious and sustained backlash by a betrayed and angry populace, when unprepared intellectually, emotionally, or psychologically for collapse, will sweep aside the Democrats and most of the Republicans. It was the economic collapse in Yugoslavia that gave us Slobodan Milosevic. It was the Weimar Republic that vomited up Adolf Hitler. And it was the breakdown in Tsarist Russia that opened the door for Lenin and the Bolsheviks. A cobble of proto-fascist misfits, from Christian demagogues to loudmouth talk show hosts, who we naively dismiss as buffoons, will find a following with promises of revenge, moral renewal, and new glory. There are powerful corporate entities arrayed against us. These anti-democratic forces, which will make an alliance with the radical Christian right and other extremists, will use fear, chaos, the hatred for the ruling elites, and the specter of left-wing dissent and terrorism to impose draconian controls to extinguish our democracy. And while they do it, they will be waving the American flag chanting patriotic slogans, promising law and order, and clutching the Christian cross. Totalitarianism, George Orwell pointed out, is not so much an age of faith, but an age of schizophrenia. A society becomes totalitarian when its structure becomes flagrantly artificial, Orwell wrote. That is, when its ruling class has lost its function, but succeeds in clinging to power by force or fraud. And force is soon all the elites will have left. And yet, even in the face of catastrophe, mass culture assures us that if we close our eyes, if we visualize what we want, if we have faith in ourselves, if we tell God that we believe in miracles, if we tap into our inner strength, if we grasp that we are truly exceptional, if we focus on happiness, our lives will be harmonious and complete. This cultural retreat into illusion, whether peddled by positive psychologists Hollywood or Christian preachers is a form of magical thinking. It turns worthless mortgages and debt into wealth. It turns the destruction of our manufacturing base into an opportunity for growth. It turns alienation and anxiety into a cheerful conformity. It turns a nation that wages illegal wars and administers offshore penal colonies where it openly practices torture into the greatest democracy on earth. How will we cope with our decline? 
where we cling to the absurd dreams of an imperial superpower and the fantasies of a glorious tomorrow? Or will we responsibly face our stark new limitations? Will we heed those who are sober and rational, those who speak of a new simplicity and humility in an age of imperial as well as material decline? Or will we follow the demagogues and charlatans who rise up in moments of crisis and panic to offer fantastic visions of new glory? Will we radically transform our system to one that protects the ordinary citizen and fosters the common good, that defies the corporate state, that dismantles empire? Or will we employ the brutality and technology of our internal security and surveillance apparatus to crush dissent and drive us into a new dark age? Coalitions of environmental, anti-nuclear, anti-capitalist, sustainable agriculture and anti-globalization forces have coalesced in Europe to form and support socialist parties. This has yet to happen in the United States. The left never rallied in significant numbers behind Cynthia McKinney or Ralph Nader, and this was our mistake. In picking the lesser of two evils, it threw its lot in with the Democratic Party that has again proven it backs our imperial wars, empowers the national security state, does the bidding of corporations, and ignores the needs of citizens. If Obama does not end the flagrant theft of taxpayer dollars by corporations and the disgraceful abandonment of our working class especially as foreclosures, foreclosures and unemployment mount. Many in the country will turn in desperation to the far right, embodied by groups such as Christian radicals. The failure to offer a democratic, populist alternative, the only alternative remaining that can save our open society, to openly make war on corporate power, will mean there will be in the eyes of many embittered and struggling working and middle class Americans no alternative but a perverted Christian fascism. I spent two years traveling the country to write a book on the Christian right called American Fascists, the Christian Right, and the War on America. I visited former manufacturing towns where for many the end of the world is no longer an abstraction. They have lost hope. Fear and instability has plunged the working class into profound personal and economic despair, and not surprisingly into the arms of the demagogues and charlatans who offer a belief in magic, miracles, and the fiction of a utopian Christian nation. And unless we rapidly reenfranchise these dispossessed workers back into the economy, unless we give them meaningful employment, relief from crippling mortgages, an end to foreclosures, and a health care system that does not drive them into bankruptcy, our democracy is doomed. Democracies, as Plutarch and Thucydides understood, cannot be sustained in oligarchic states. Social and political reform never comes from accommodating the power structure. It comes from frightening it. The Liberty Party, which fought slavery, the suffragists who battled for women's rights, the labor movement, and the civil rights movements knew that the question, as Karl Popper wrote, was not how do we get good people to rule. Most of those attracted to power are at best mediocre and often venal. But how do we limit the damage the powerful do to us? These mass movements were the real engines for social reform, the correctives to our democracy, and the true protectors of the rights of citizens. They never achieved formal political power, but they are a reminder that as Studs Terkel used to say, 
Hope has never trickled down. It has always sprung up. We must opt out of the mainstream. We must articulate and stand firmly and unequivocally, even if this turns us at first into outcasts on the side of working men and women. We must no longer be content with the crumbs tossed to us by the power elite in the vain hope that accommodation will work. We must become as militant as those who are seeking our enslavement. If we remain passive, we will soon be engulfed by a ruthless totalitarian capitalism. If we remain passive, as we undergo the largest transference of wealth upwards in American history, we will become serfs. If we fight back, we have a chance. The saturation coverage of Jackson's death was yet another example of our collective flight into illusion. It deflected the more questions arising from mounting injustice, growing inequalities, costly imperial wars, economic collapse, and political corruption. As we sink into an economic and political morass, as we barrel towards a crisis, we remain controlled, manipulated, and distracted by the celluloid shadows on the wall of Plato's cave. The fantasy of celebrity culture is not designed simply to entertain. It is designed to drain us emotionally, confuse us about our identity, blame ourselves for our predicament, condition us to chase illusions of unachievable fame and happiness, and keep us from fighting back. And in the end, that is all the Jackson coverage was really about, another tawdry and tasteless spectacle to divert a dying culture from the baying wolf at the gate. Thank you. Do you want to do a few questions? Yeah. Uh, we have microphones on both, uh, both sides. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, one of the things that strikes me about our, our malaise is, I think, a very dangerous um, development, which I see in, in my students and I see in the culture generally, and I think is perhaps the best way to render us passive and uncritical, which is the undermining of rationality as a value, the undermining of the capacity to reason, the respect for reason, the respect for evidence, and the very concept of truth. And I'm one, first of all, I'm wondering if you see this as well, and if you do, if this is a cause or a consequence of the sorts of phenomena that you've been describing. Well, an image-based culture, which we, is, is what we live in, has destroyed our print-based culture, which is why the publishing industry and newspapers are dying. Now, I spent over two decades writing for newspapers, and um, I'm not going to pretend that, that they didn't come with serious flaws. The lies that newspapers told, commercial newspapers, were the lies of omission. It's what they didn't tell you. But what they did tell you was based on verifiable fact. It was reported, edited, fact-checked, and then presented. With the destruction of print-based media, what we're losing 
is that cultural foundation of verifiable fact. So you are saturated with images. We are a society utterly awash in lies, courtesy of the advertising industry. And you confuse how you're made to feel with knowledge, which is how Obama got elected. <clears throat> I'm very good friends with Dennis Kucinich. Uh, and uh, Dennis kept saying during the primary, he'd imitate these, uh, when he was a kid, he'd go to the watch baseball in Cleveland, and they'd, uh, uh, the guys would say, get the, get the scorecard, get the scorecard, look at the batting averages. He kept, he said, you got to look at, forget the rhetoric, you got to look at Obama's voting record, his two years in the Senate, which was awful. Mm -hmm. And uh, totalitarian societies are image, image spectacle-based societies. Uh, they are societies in which the primacy of fact is irrelevant, where opinions and facts are interchangeable, and where lies are true. And that's what's happening. And you can see it. You can see it. That's how we can actually have debates about death panels or uh, have a, a viable presidential candidate who believes that all human and animal life was created 6,000 years ago, who now has a talk show on a major television cable. I mean, well, that's where we're headed. Um, and when, you, when a society becomes unmoored from verifiable fact, then you're finished. Because people react emotionally, and whoever appeals to them or taps into their emotional response speaks truth. I'm a great, although I write for the internet, I'm also a great critic of the internet because what it's done is ghettoize both the left and the right, created clans that uh, chant the same slogans and hate the same enemies. Uh, and the value, of, uh, many values of a, a newspaper, not only did it give you a sense of physical uh, identity to a city or an area, uh, but it was democratic in the information that it gave you. It gave you information that you may not want. It gave you information that you may have been uncomfortable with. Uh, and with the destruction of newspapers, uh, we are retreating and creating these vast uh, cultural divides. I mean, after writing my book on the Christian right, and I look at the Christian right as a mass movement, not as a religious movement. I mean, one of my uh, frustrations with the mainstream churches, which I come out of, is that uh, they never denounced this movement. They left it to these people like Christopher Hitchens, who I debated in Berkeley, which is not an experience I'd wish on anyone in this room, <laughs> and uh, Sam Harris, and these, uh, they, they the, the Christian right, they're heretics. Um, they have utterly distorted the message of the gospel. Jesus. There's no reading of the gospel uh, that, uh, legitimate reading of the gospel that could say that Jesus wanted us to accumulate vast amounts of material possessions or power. I think when Jesus died, all he owned was a robe. Uh, it's an utter preoccupation with the poor and justice, aside from the fact that Jesus was a pacifist. Uh, and, and when they talk about acculturating America with Christian values, what they've done is the inverse. They've acculturated the worst aspects of American capitalism and greed, as well as American imperialism, into the Christian religion. And uh, my, my, I think one of the reasons the liberal church has nothing to say to us is because in the name of tolerance, uh, they refuse to stand up for what they purportedly espouse and believe in. Um, so, this, the, I, I, my book didn't look at the movement as a religious movement, but as a traditional proto-fascist mass movement, which I think is correct. Thank you also for your talk. Uh, 
and for your columns. I find them extraordinary. Since you mentioned uh, Cynthia McKinney, the courageous former congressperson from Georgia, and also since you have a, an, an advanced uh, divinity degree, I'm very curious as to whether you're familiar with the works of David Ray Griffin, uh, the books he's written about the events of 9-11, and whether or not you've you know his work, what your take is on the claims of the 9-11 truth movement. Yeah. Okay, I'll get, my personal opinion is that uh, the government wasn't involved in 9-11. Um, however, I'm willing to qualify that as a reporter to say that I've not investigated it. And I'm just too good a reporter to have opinions about things I haven't investigated. But that's my opinion. Uh, I did spend a year of my life covering al-Qaeda, and a lot of my life looking at, very closely at those uh, two weeks uh, before 9-11, uh, every step that Mohammed Atta took, including the 10 days in Spain where I went to every pension where he slept and saw his name in the book. And, um, uh, so um, I haven't read his stuff. I know who he is. But I don't think that, I think that the Bush administration was just asleep at the switch, that it was incompetence that allowed it to happen. Just, just before his death, Walter Cronkite made a statement that he questioned whether the populace in this country has the intelligence to sustain, to sustain a democracy. Uh, would you comment on that? With 42 million Americans are illiterate. 50 million Americans are semi-literate. That means they read at a fourth or fifth grade level. That's a third of the country. And then you have tens of millions of Americans who are technically literate but don't read. 80% of American households did not buy a book last year. When you unmoor yourself from a print-based society, you begin to speak, think, in cliches, jargon, and slogans. Um, and uh, that the rise of an image-based society coupled with a willful destruction of our educational system uh, has created huge pockets of the population that are driven by emotion. There's a very good article in the New York Times front page story two days ago about a uh, huge investigative piece on the whole Tea Party militia movement. It's actually quite a fine piece of reporting. That goes very much what I found in my book on the Christian right. And uh, with the destruction of journalism, We've lost almost all our foreign bureaus. Television news is a farce. I don't own a television, and I'm not missing anything. Um, so yeah, the signs aren't, aren't, aren't very good. Um, I'm interested in the, the double speak um, aspect of things. I. You know, we talk about the Patriot Act, which should really be called the Unpatriot Act. Uh, Citizens United, uh, which should really be called Corporations United. And um, it's come along through the advertising industry, the media saying, oh, soak in this detergent, it's good for your hands. And at least the cynicism it seems to me, and so we have this pervasive cynicism. I'm just wondering your take on this as well. Well, if you go back and look at the Committee on Public Information that was set up in World War I by Wilson, the Creole Commission, which employed Edward Bernays, sort of the father of modern advertising. These figures were steeped in Freudian psychology. They understood that people are not moved by fact, but primarily through emotional manipulation. 
That's how they eroticize the car, that kind of stuff. So that, uh, for instance, in the 1954 coup in Guatemala, Bernays was hired by the CIA to sell it to the American public. These people know very, very well what they're doing. They're very skillful. Uh, and it's worse than, I mean, you're right, of course, it's doublespeak, but it's worse than doublespeak. Uh, it is uh, knowing instinctually, even if you have the intellectual tools to resist it, they know instinctually how to move you emotionally. Uh, and they're very, very good at it. And, and, and with the rise of this public relations industry, we have now more public relations employees, than, people who work for public relations than we do journalists. And the destruction of a journalistic core that is based on verifiable fact. We've lost 20,000 jobs in journalism over the last two years. We're down to about 40,000 full time. Papers are on the edge of bankruptcy. The Philadelphia Inquirer, the San Francisco Chronicle, papers are shuddering right and left. And what's left? I mean, look at the Portland Press Herald. It, you know, it's so thin. I mean, compare what that was 20 years ago. So you have the rise of powerful organs of propaganda, uh, the decline of uh, a print-based culture, and, um, and a huge mass of people who are very enraged and very disenfranchised. It's, it's not a new story. I mean, read Origins of Totalitarianism by Hannah Arendt, read uh, The Culture of Despair by Fritz Stern, read um, the Open Society and Its Enemies by Karl Popper. I mean, the engines of totalitarian movement or the engine of totalitarian movement is personal and economic despair. And that has been true throughout human history. When you create despair on that level, you inevitably create horrible consequences. We were just speaking about, I was saying how similar I find what's happening in the United States to what happened in Yugoslavia. The war in Yugoslavia was caused by the economic collapse of Yugoslavia. 25,000% inflation, the closing of huge factories, massive unemployment. And Yugoslavia, like the United States, there were only four countries in the world where you needed a visa if you were Yugoslav. They had a standard of living uh, that was envied throughout certainly all of Eastern Europe. The average income for Yugoslav was 1,500 Deutsche Mark a month. So that like the United States, it was, they had high, that, that high expectations and the crushing of the, the cutting off of those expectations. And it, it scores bad enough when you lose your job, but when you realize that it's not only hopeless for you, but it's, but it's hopeless for your children, then you have tinder for political catastrophe. And the, the, the writers of the French Revolution and other, I mean, the, the, it, it's not necessarily poverty that drives collapse. It, 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 it is about a society who sees its expectations for life thwarted and crushed that drives um, movements I, like that. Uh, you certainly paint a very dismal and depressing future. And I wondered, I have two questions about that. One is, uh, do you see anything out there that might indicate that something other than what you've described might happen to make a change here. And I'd also be interested in knowing, uh, exploring what the difference might be, or is there a difference, between what's happening here and Western Europe? Well, you know, as a war correspondent for many years, we never used the word pessimist or optimist. Um, you, we made a, tried to make a pretty sober assessment of what weapon systems were down at the end of that road and what our capacity to get by them were. People had a very Pollyannish view or somehow thought that they were immortal, uh, didn't live very long in war zones. So I'm only interested in, a, in an honest assessment. I don't think you can talk about hope until you have a very clear understanding of the reality around you. Otherwise, you become utopian. And I use the word the way Thomas More coined it 
1516. Utopia means no place. It doesn't exist. I was very outspoken against the war in Iraq. I spent seven years in the Middle East, months of my life in Iraq. I speak Arabic. And I, I like most Arabists, knew that people inculcated with Ba'athism were not going to greet us as liberators, that uh, democracy was not going to be implanted in Baghdad and emanate across the Middle East, uh, that the oil revenues were not going to pay for reconstruction. That was a utopian belief. It was a non-reality-based belief, which got us into all the trouble that we're now in. So I think uh, however unpleasant reality may be, you can't move forward until you grasp what reality is. Um, unfortunately, the liberal class in this country is bankrupt. Um, the liberal class in this country should have walked out on the Democratic Party in 1994. And it didn't. Uh, and every four years they scare us. Uh, and it gets worse and worse and worse. And the, the, the worst thing the Obama administration has done is that it's codified the uh, destruction of constitutional rights that were put in place by the Bush administration, including habeas corpus. That's the, it's now bipartisan. Uh, so when you have a liberal class that no longer has any kind of fortitude, and Dostoevsky's Notes from Underground was a book about this, defeated dreamers. People who all voted for Obama and then it didn't work so they don't vote anymore. You enter an age of moral nihilism. Dostoevsky saw very clearly in the 1870s what was coming. And um, if we had remained true to the interests of the working class, then we would have a kind of credibility. But I think the anger of the working class towards liberals is not misplaced, because liberals are hypocritical in the sense that they speak about protecting the working class and the rights of the working class, and yet support a party that's decimated. The working is now decimating the middle class. It's that question of, you know, will you step out of the mainstream? And, and it requires, I've, I, I supported and voted for Ralph Nader in this last election. And when I would get up and say this in public gatherings, even in places like Berkeley, I would be booed and hissed. Who's, who, who, who's going to f publicly acknowledge the very uncomfortable truth that everything Ralph said about Obama is true? Thank you for your lecture. Um, I'm an educator and presently I'm working at a secondary level and I teach literacy and I teach comprehension through the Socratic method. So um, I was listening to your statistical quotes about illiteracy throughout the nation and I, what I've seen as an educator in secondary level for 15 years is that I've never seen more rich print available to students as I see have as, you know, previous to the 15 years. What I do see is that a trend not to use any kind of method of inquiry or Socratic method or where the question is indeed the answer. It seems to me that that's the lack of engagement rather than a lack of literacy. And I wanted to know what you thought about that. That we don't have a climate that fosters uh, an opportunity to pose questions or to have that kind of discourse, whether uh, that's a mo that's definitely not a model that I see in public schools. And well, so anywhere that's what standardized testing does. I mean, it, it, I, I don't know. It rewards a very peculiar kind of intelligence, which is analytical. I mean, I've taught at Princeton, so these kids come in uh, on, on a certain level very smart, but on another level very stupid. Um, so there's a chapter in the book called The Illusion of Wisdom, which is, right. addresses all of these points. Um, in, in, true intellectual thought is by its nature subversive, as Socrates understood, which is why I, didn't, I drank hemlock. 
um, because it challenges assumptions and structures. But we have an educational system that never challenges assumptions and structures, but at our most elite level produces systems managers. Lawrence Summers is the perfect example. Youngest tenured economics professor at Harvard, um, uh, yet utterly lacking in common sense. The only thing these people know how to do is sustain a system, which is what they're doing. They don't know how to question the system. And uh, that's why you would see Goldman Sachs descend on Princeton and suck all these kids off to Wall Street, where all they're doing is gambling. They're not producing anything. They're utterly parasitic. Uh, uh, and, I, and I really feel the, that preoccupation with data uh, and the amassing of data. My son, who's bilingual in French and English and a voracious reader, took the SATs and got a very high math score and, a, and not a great critical reading score, which made no sense to us. He didn't even like math. So I did what upper middle class parents do and brought in one of these you know, absurdly price, high priced tutors. And I heard her say to him, stop asking yourself whether it's true. You'll just give them the answer. He took the test and his, his critical reading score, you know, a month later rose by 130 points because he stopped asking him, stopped, he stopped thinking. That's my question to you. I, I'm wondering if systemically, you know, you're, you're making reference to a lack of literacy, and I wonder if systemically it's a lack of inquiry that is really what... Well, it's both, it's both because, you know, when McDonald's hires cashiers, it's why on the punch keys on their cash register they have pictures. I'm not joking. Well, no, I, I mean, we're, we're dealing with... You're right. I'm not contesting your point. But illiteracy is also huge within this country. And when people are illiterate, um, they are effectively imprisoned by advertising. They can't read the directions on the back of a package of medicine. They can't negotiate complicated subprime mortgage deals because they can't read. Yes, but I, what I'm seeing in the climate of public schools is that we have very literate students graduating, but they don't seem to go into realms of thinking that are critical well, thinking. And I agree. I mean, the, 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 the problem is that you have the upper third of the country who are trained to regurgitate data, not to think. And then you have huge sections of the country that are illiterate or semi-literate, and the combination is disaster. I mean, what you, we are creating with an American oligarchy is two-thirds of the country will live in a form of neo-feudalism, and the upper third uh, will, will manage the corporate state. Uh, we have one more question, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Given the situation, as you've outlined it to us today, that we're all very aware of, but um, are there two or three specific suggestions that you'd like to impart upon us before we leave, uh, given that most of us still believe that there's, there's some hope, there's some possibility that uh, this could be turned around? As you said, the, the, uh, the, uh, the left wing of this country has been marginalized, and, and perhaps you may have some specific suggestions about how to build that up, or specific suggestions about how to turn what, what we all see happening around. Don't, don't vote for any Democrats or Republicans. Break the back of the consumer economy. 70% of the economy is driven by consumption. The less you consume, the better. Um, food is going to become a huge issue because We've created such a distorted food distribution system that I live in New Jersey, my tomatoes are all grown in California. What happens when oil is $5? Gasoline is $5 a gallon. You already see, I just wrote a story for Harper's Magazine that will be out in May about Camden, New Jersey, which per capita is the poorest city in the country. 
It's a food desert. There's no supermarket. People eat grease and sugar. And those food deserts will expand as poverty expands. So food is important. It's going to be, food is going to become a political issue. Um, I think resistance will all be local. Uh, so to the extent that you can build community structures that sever yourself from the formal economy and from the formal political system, the better it is. But there, you know, the Republicans will nominate some jerk like Sarah Palin or so, and scare everyone into voting for Obama. And that isn't going to make it. It's, that's over. That's not going to save us because what's killing us is the corporate state, quite literally. I mean, it's literally killing the ecosystem on which human life depends. And if we don't begin to defy the corporate state, really soon, we're finished. I mean, they've just gutted Kyoto. Copenhagen was an unmitigated disaster. Um, we have about a foot and a half of snow in Princeton because uh, with rising uh, temperatures in the south, all that humid air is being pushed north. I mean, it's just what the climate change scientists have told us is going to happen. Time is running out. It's a crisis. And um, again, we, we are captivated by illusion, uh, which is fed to us across the political spectrum, from Oprah to Hollywood to Tony Robbins. To, that's what corporatism is about. So um, and the, the, the rage on the part of people flocking to these proto-fascist right-wing movements, like the Tea Party movements, is, uh, is one that will not be contained because there's nothing the Democrats or the Republicans have offered to save these people. In fact, quite the opposite. So, um, yeah, I'd get, you know, I'd get really ornery. I mean, like all my relatives, although they're all like really right wing, so I don't do that. <laughs> my, my grandfather proudly used to tell about all the communist strikers he beat the shit out of as a sergeant in the main National Guard. He kept, a, he kept his, uh, his truncheon in the barn, and he, every, for every communist he'd whacked on the head, he'd put a little nick in it. <laughs> so, anyway. Well, thank you so much. Thanks. And this note. <laughs> I just want to make one announcement before you leave. This coming Monday, we have David Smith, who is with us today, and who, in fact, recommended, uh, uh, I'm getting in touch with Chris Hedges before I did, uh, who's going to be giving a talk on war and human nature. He has written extensively on the subject of human uh, evolution and human nature, and I thought you'd be a very interesting event. And on, on the subject of literacy, this Center for Global Humanities is trying to live up to some of its expectations by inviting lecturers to give us these uh, lectures and also assign a book along with the lecture so that we can come somewhat prepared to ask questions and engage the speakers in a meaningful way. Good night. Thank you.